All right. Hi, everyone. Hope you've enjoyed the readings this week. Uh, we're talking about what labor and regulations and uh, you know automation, I guess. So it's uh, quite an interesting topic, I think, and pretty heavy sometimes. Yeah. So one of the articles was quite heavy, uh, in my opinion, and Hans. Uh, so we have prepared a few things for you, Hans. Should we start with the video about uh, you know this issue with automation and the future of work? Or you want to start with the with the with your presentation? Um, let's go ahead and, and start with my presentation because I think that'll that'll set up this uh, this future of work idea because there's some history there. That might Sounds be great. Sounds great. Okay, so I'll let you share your screen. Well, give me a second. Right, security. Share the screen. Now the floor is yours. Okay. Okay, so as you guys probably noticed, this article that uh, Meg Letta Ambrose wrote, um, it was quite technical. She's both a, a, a she's got a Juris Doctorate and a, an, an academic PhD, and she a lot was going on in that article. She was dealing with some history, and basically trying to say we need to use the lessons of history in order to inform regulation that's going to come up in. AI and other kinds of machine learning contexts. Uh, and we've talked about this a lot, right? Everybody says, well, this is such brand new things. How do we move forward? And so what she's trying to do is saying, look, if we look at the way that people have dealt with technological change in the past and seen the mistakes they've made, that can tell us how to avoid those same mistakes in the future. And just as a completely separate plug, there's a really neat uh, podcast. I think I've mentioned this before. There's a very neat podcast done uh, together by it's New York Public Radio and The Economist magazine called The Secret History of the Future, where they talk, for instance, in talking about uh, the issue of um, self-driving cars, they talk about the way that people in cities first reacted to cars being around when they were used to horses and people being modes of communication and, and all those things that needed to be negotiated. And also uh, they go into this very interesting case where that were used by the military to send messages down the line by raising flags and people use those to uh, send information about the stock trades that were happening in Paris to the coast and so people could make investments. So the idea is that some of these things we're facing now have had analogs. Uh, Ambrose was talking about. Let me. I have to find the right page. Ironies of automation. There we go. Okay. The main issue that she wants to address or challenge oops losing control of my documents here oh, okay the main issue she wants to address or challenge is that she thinks there's this paradigm in the way legislators and lawyers and ethicists have thought about bringing in technology and legislating technology for closes is the a way of thinking of people versus machines as two separate autonomous. And this is connected to what we talked about in the article by um, uh, the article about moral crumple zones, where they talked about uh, socio-technical and, and interpersonal technical things. Um, the, the, the problem with this old paradigm, she says, is this approach focuses on the capabilities of, tech, of te the technology to draw lines and protect and promote values. Um, and she noticed an article by this woman, Bainbridge, back in 1983, where she said, you try to design automation to improve the life of the operator. And the irony is that this sometimes can make the, the, the life of the operator worse, not better. So she goes all the way back to 1893 to talk about this. So obviously this isn't machine learning, but it has to do with the interaction of humans and machines. Uh, working in the railroads, which was the most important transportation method in, in well, a lot of the world actually, uh, India even at this time was, was very train oriented and uh, 
there were trains, actually there was a train between here and Damascus. There were, there were lots of, of these around. Um, uh, the U.S. Congress, there was, it was very, very dangerous. Lots and lots of people got injured and maimed uh, working on railroads. Uh, and it, so it isn't so much being as the train is moving, it's getting the trains put together and, and, and joined up and in and out and loaded up with freight where the uh, injuries would happen. So one of the things they noticed were all these railroad workers were missing fingers, hands, or got crushed by trying to um, get the, the trains linked together. And I have some examples here that illustrated it. The, syst the old system for, where did that one go? Um, oh, maybe that webpage disappeared on me. The old system used to be called a link and pin. Safari, and if you, no? right? If you open Safari, you had it open, I think, right? If you go down, yeah, you just pull it up, right? The hands, I think you need to pull it up. I see it. Like the um, bar, right? Yeah, if you, if you say what? I think the bar is down there. You just pulled it down, right? Oh, so, yeah, so I see it, but uh, you go to the bottom, right? Yeah, and then pull yeah. it up. Yeah, oh, it's not coming. Ah, there we go. You're right, ah. you're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, okay. The old system before was called uh, Lincoln Pin, and this is an example of it. Where and and you may have come across a Lincoln Pin couple before if you've sometimes pickup trucks will use them. Where, uh, but if you've ever had a tractor and you're pulling a wagon behind it at all, basically you just have a circle, and and then another thing goes over, it. and then when you get the two circles lined up, you drop a pin in there. And there's some examples of those pins. Um, oh, I thought there were. So you, you it, but it, it, take, it takes physically getting between the train cars and putting your hand there and sticking the pin in there to uh, to hold the thing in place. And then there was another thing invented. Um, that was called the knuckle coupler. Um, which works like this and you get the two train car, cars moving together and they hit and they just automatically lock. And so you don't have to have somebody's physical hand in between there. But there's an issue there that the way you do this is you have to get the train moving kind of fast in order for that to work because it's a mechanical trigger. You have to get enough pressure going so when they hit, it moves from this moves from this position to this one to this one, and that's a, a knuckle coupler, the automatic couplers that they had were patented in 1873. And so the issue there is if you don't know that the train is going to back up, it's going at a fast enough speed that if it hits you, you're either going to get your legs crushed and the wheels hit you, or it'll just crush you and you and you and you'll be killed. So this is relevant because. Although lots of people were getting hit by the uh, hurt by the, the the link and pen coupling system, they kind of knew what they were doing. So after they made this, uh, so intuitively, when you look at it as a non-professional or non-trained person, it seems like that automatic coupling would get rid of all these lost fingers and hands and 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 crushed people because you don't have to have people in between the cars. So before the implication uh, implementation of this law in the 1890s, one in 428 employees was killed and one in 33 were injured, which is really scary. If you were told when you went on a job that <laughs> one out of every 30 people ends up getting maimed, you wouldn't want to do it. And you have to be careful because these, these numbers were backwards from statistics usually because the idea is how big is the set? It's like, what is a, do, do one in a thousand or one in 2000 smokers get cancer is the kind of idea. So. The number's lower, but it's, but that's bad because after they impl in, in, implemented this, one in 357 employees were killed and one in 19 were injured. So now more than 5% of each one working were, were injured. And what went wrong? Uh, uh, Ambrose asked us, Policymakers saw humans being injured, but failed to recognize how humans were interacting with the cars and each other to achieve, achieve objectives that 
would need to do so with the automated additions. But that would, to achieve objectives, it would need to do so with the automated additions. And then there was a lo much longer process. Once they realized this, there was a law passed in 1910. And then the companies, because it wasn't good for them, for their workers to, can, to keep getting injured in death, the company started implementing it too on a voluntary basis. And that eventually, it took a long time, but, but a law passed in 1910. By 1940, led to a 75% decrease in injuries and deaths. One important difference is that the companies got involved. This wasn't just a law from the top. And they listened to their employees when they, when they said, you know, what makes you feel in danger when you're in the, the, the rail yard? So this is the, and, and she goes through several of these. I think there's about seven of them in the article. These examples of times in the past when either regulators or judges or people trying to figure out how to protect human interest when you're interacting with new technology have misunderstood the relationship between people and technology in there. And again, went back to this dynamic she's, we named at the beginning called man versus machine. And you say you focus on the technology, the, the capability of the technology as opposed to the interaction of the people and the other. So with that as background, I think it'll help make sense of the conclusion that she reaches at the end of the paper, which we'll just go through now and read together. So now we're moving forward, what, almost 130 years. <laughs> and we'll say human automation systems researchers continue to be pressured to design within a dangerous automate everything mindset. And while not, this is another aside she brings up, which we don't need to talk about with this guy, Wiener. Um, while they're not necessarily that, they are critical of automation and its implementation. These research have investigated the many ways in which placing a human or her necessary involvement in certain loops impacts performance, speaking directly to concerns about safety. Through the various phases developed within the short lifespan of this research field, models have been produced to help guide system designers. The research is limited to the loosely defined objectives of the system, but should nonetheless be a starting point for informed legal approach to human in the loop. The law to this point has fallen prey to the man versus machine way of thinking that focuses on the capabilities of the technology to draw a line. Not have the luxury of taking decades that have developed in the fields from system engineering to human computer interaction. It must catch up with research and practices as it stands today and deal with the introduction of sophisticated automation as the complex interdependent socio-technical process that it is. So the dynamic is complex, interdependent, and socio-technical. Establishing a framework that complements safe and actual use of automation for it has become a pressing issue as the government seeks to regulate drones, big data, smartphones, and driverless cars. Initial work must be done to articulate principles to guide ethical design and lay a foundation to build policy upon. Relying on human automation models to add layers of ethical or legal considerations can serve to guide responsible and accountable design and implementation of automation. So there's two issues in there that would come up repeatedly in the article that she doesn't cover in the conclusion that I, I should emphasize. One is, um, she says, look, there's two main tendencies people have had in the, in, the, in, the, in the past. One is to take the person out of the loop, which is, which is the railroad example is a good example. We say, look, it's just too dangerous for these guys to be standing in between these cars and putting the pin in physically with their hand. Let's try to get them completely out of it. But that ignores the fact that you've still got people in the yard and if they're gonna be responsible if things go slowly and they don't get to train off on time. So they're gonna be close enough to be hurt if when the process is going on. And the other way that they've thought on the man versus machine or person versus machine model is in terms of taking the, making the person be in the loop where you say, look, the person will be in there as a fail safe and we will we'll, we'll make the decision if something is gonna go bad. And that was her point when that example from 1983, when these people in the United States Navy had technology that was supposed to detect Soviet bombers. And then the, the, the system was telling them that's a Soviet bomber, maybe armed with a nuclear weapon. And the guys in the ship were like, but this just seems like it's a plane flying from 
uh, South Korea to Japan. Um, it doesn't seem like it's doing anything military, but they didn't want to be the person who interrupted this very smart system and said, oh, I know more than this. And then maybe the Soviet bomber could drop a nuclear bomb and start a war and cause all kinds of problems. So in both of those situations, these attempts to protect human interests by either saying the people the person needs to be out or the person needs to be in backfired and made the situation worse for the person, the operator. Um, so that's her idea that, that, that we need when we put together legislation and policy and oversight, we just kind of need to acknowledge the fact that this is always going to be an interactive process between the technology and the humans. And I, I, several of you picked up on this neat example uh, in the paper in your reflections, I, I, I noticed that there was this open chess tournament that allowed people to use just themselves or to be supplemented with, with a, a computing device. And the people who did the best, the teams that did the best were relatively naive or unpracticed chess, human chess players with relatively good software for playing chess. They were better than grandmasters and they were better than experienced ones. And they were better than pure machines too, better than machines playing on their own. So that was just an example of how using the skill sets together led to good results. Okay, that's my best effort at making that big article a little bit less mysterious. I hope that was helpful and I would be happy to answer any questions or hear any comments anybody has at this point. Have any comments, guys? Maybe I, I'll start, right, to start the discussion or encourage people to chip in. So one thing uh, that I was thinking about, remember when we talked about the humans in the loop, I think what you concluded with, Hans, is really spot on. It's uh, the, the movement from saying, you know, human in the loop towards, you know, humans and machines working together towards, you know, a better uh, outcome for humans. So humans is really not part of the loop. It's uh, that end goal, really. It's everywhere. It's all over the place. And really, the idea is that machines should collaborate with humans or interact with humans to, you know, provide better future. So I tried to find this out. We had a workshop last year on the future of work, and we we're talking about, you know, how AI will affect future of work. And we wrote a visionary paper I think that was called Imagine, you know, uh, machines and humans, uh, you know, working together for the future uh, of work, right? I'll try to dig this out. I mean, you could uh, and add it to, uh, to more. Okay, other people have any comments or thoughts on this? No, we just have two people saying that it made sense, which is good, I suppose. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, I have actually, so one of the examples that I have for you is uh, an incident that is very recent that kind of talks exactly about this. So it's almost like a, one of the case studies that could have been, uh, you know, uh, added to the to this paper. Uh, so I hope, you know, you will see the connection between what Hans said and, and what this, uh, you know, incident is. Uh, but let me start, I mean, I guess by uh, doing the following. I want to share with you a video. Uh, so we'll move a little bit. So the topic of, of, of this week was to kind of talk about regula regulation and, you know, also automation, how it affects the labor market or, you know, unemployment. So there is this one video that I thought would be interesting to share with you. I'm going to play now once I get to the, yeah, here. And it talks about, you know, really how uh, automation is going to affect, uh, you know, uh, the future of work. We are essentially entering a new industrial revolution. We're going to wipe out millions of jobs in the, in the United States. Well, how far we are going to go could easily be that everything that really can be automated. Well, I don't think it would be responsible to just let the consequences rip. And then we find that large numbers of people are displaced and miserable and angry. 
and well armed. And we just figure, well, you know, let's see what happens. We're going to need machines that can go up and down stairs, uh, go through hallways and doorways, uh, handle broken concrete, and just generally go where people go. I'm at a robotics show at the forefront of what is quickly becoming reality. It's going to start to be a pretty commonplace thing to see robots trundling around in buildings, on the streets, etc. And that's only going to grow and grow and grow. Jonathan Hurst spun this company out of his robotics research at Oregon State University. In general, people's lifestyles are going to change, and that's going to change the way cities look, too. This is a story about how robots will affect jobs. But first, we need to understand how far artificial intelligence and robotics have already come. Warehouses and factories are being run by robots as the lights are turned off to save on energy costs. Sensors that power autonomous movement are much faster than ever before. Cars and planes are operating by themselves. Robots are doing fine detail work and responding to our every move. They're entering the service sector, displacing fast food workers and baristas. In five to 10 years time, robotics is going to disappear from our awareness because it is going to be what all of our smart products have and do. Robots are replacing jobs like security guards with self-driving surveillance vehicles. I said, step away from the machine. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Hey, hey. Five, four, three, <laughs> what? Two. Really? We're not all the way there. This company had a few public mishaps, like this robot suicide in a fountain. I asked the CEO about it. You're never going to learn uh, without actually being out in the field. So the kinks are getting worked out quickly. And today, it's impossible to see such futuristic technology without wondering about the impact on jobs. An endless array of robots are entering our everyday lives. Pair that with advances in artificial intelligence, machine learning, 3D printing, and the changes are hard to comprehend. Worldwide, 800 million jobs could be automated by 2030. In the United States, up to 73 million jobs are at risk. Changes have taken place throughout history, like the industrialization of agriculture. Only this time, it's on a far faster time scale. Jonathan said he too has concerns about job displacement. Definitely something that can be handled well, as long as um, governments and policymakers are aware of these changes that are happening and planning for it and preparing for it. You think we're doing that? I do not think that we're doing that at present. Numerous companies turned down requests to talk about the effects automation will have on employment. You know, you don't want to write a banner over your company logo, we are America's job killers, correct? So like, that's the last thing that you want to do. And one of America's biggest job killers may be driverless vehicles already driving on our roads. This promo video shows Google's subsidiary, Waymo, operating self-driving vehicles on the road without a driver to take the wheel if something goes wrong. But companies like Google, Toyota, Tesla, GM, and Uber declined to discuss innovation or jobs, even as they greenlit the use of these promotional videos. Uh, we're recreating a scenario where we've had a pickup truck drive along the track and actually dump some hay bales out of the back randomly. So what you're going to see is our car senses, does a safe lane change, senses the next one, and also then changes back. The vehicles are arriving faster than many might expect. GM announced that a vehicle without any human controls would hit the streets in 2019. And Uber placed an order for up to 24,000 self-driving Volvos last year. The task for society with regard to car driving, Uber drivers, taxi drivers, truck drivers, is to think about um, what we want to do with people who are displaced. It's not hard to picture the Uber and Lyft-based gig economies collapsing as self-driving cars arrive. Every day, those drivers are giving companies the valuable data needed to automate. Many in the gig economy are unwittingly teaching artificial intelligence how to do their jobs. 
there's an abundance of data now. We record what we eat, what we watch. Sorry, this is an ant. 3% of the American workforce drives for a living, and that doesn't include hotels along highways, truck stops, restaurants, and other support jobs. Total trucker salaries alone add up to $300 billion per year. So it should come as no surprise that Uber got into the trucking business by building a technology platform for delivering freight and by buying an automated truck startup called Auto. If you're a truck driver right now and you haven't started thinking of getting some extra training education or so, then you're in a difficult position. So I went to meet up with some truckers at the Great American Trucking Show in Dallas, Texas. Trucker Brown was instantly recognizable because of his prolific YouTube page. This is Trucker Brown. Hello. You got a little dog right What's here. What's going on? He does videos on everything about trucking, and that includes automation. This was an avenue for people to go in to pull themselves out of poverty and have a middle class job and an honest wage. And it's, it's gonna, they want it to be gone. It's hard to overstate the importance of an entry level middle class job for millions of Americans. Every person that I see here is taking care of four other people, their family, every single person you see. And that shows you how much trucking is feeding the country. For Trucker Brown, the profession has given him a middle-class lifestyle where there are few other options. I first seen automated trucks. The first thing I thought is, what else could I do? And I ended up being homeless a few times and trying to, trying to find my way. My granddad was a trucker. My father's a trucker. I have three brothers that are truckers. My aunt's a trucker. If it becomes automated, that's gone. Then, then what, what, you know, what are the blue collar of America supposed to do? At the truck show, I met up with Todd Spencer, executive vice president of the Owner Operator Independent Drivers Association. For the vast majority of the population, they really have no comprehension of just how essential trucks and truckers are. Trucking is the most common job in 29 US states. It's really difficult to think that this is something that could be automated very quickly or very easily. Like Todd, few of the truckers at the show believe automated trucks will arrive within the next decade. Anybody who does technical backing in the docks or driving uh, in inner cities, automated trucks, good luck to them. Uh, there's a lot of time, places to get into, so I don't think automated truck can probably get into that place. Nationwide, it's starting to sink in. A recent poll found that 72% of Americans expressed concerns about robots taking their jobs. When it's cheaper to replace a worker with a robot, then eventually it'll happen. Brown drives with LaShawn Parks, who also has a YouTube channel. They largely agree on the dangers of automated trucking. Everything's automated. <laughs> Everything's automated. So, so now you took my above the poverty line job, I say, I'll just go work at a burger joint, and that's automated too. When The thing is, when does it stop? A 2016 White House report estimated that 1.3 to 1.7 million truck drivers are at risk for job automation. Add in taxis, chauffeurs, delivery trucks, and other drivers, and that number rises to 3.1 million. And even though Trucker Brown and LaShawn have an idea of what's coming, there's still healthy skepticism. But I don't, I don't, I don't see how it can get to bad weather and, and icy roads and uh, you know things like that. I just don't see it happening. At the end of the day, to me, I still believe that a driver is going to be needed to be in that truck. It's actually a common argument for automation, letting robots do tasks that are repetitive, boring, and unhealthy. The service industry is also transforming. From line cooks to baristas to servers, jobs are changing overnight. What Zoom is doing is using automation to eliminate tasks. Tasks that are unsafe, tasks that are boring, tasks that are repetitive. And what we're doing is we're elevating the occupation. So we're thinking about task automation versus occupational automation. Bigger brands are catching up. Pizza Hut just announced driverless delivery and claimed that it could actually create more jobs. 
Leah Collins, the CEO of Zoom Pizza, took us through some of the efficiencies sure. of the process. And now we're using a vision system to monitor the path of the pizza. This is a pizza that gets our spicy sauce. Giorgio dispenses classic sauce. Marta is our sauce spreading robot. This is everyone's favorite robot. So we have a robot that never drops pizza and he never gets burned. The line is optimized to do as many as 360 pizzas in an hour. That's really quite fast. The Zoom Pizza is not alone in trying to change the industry. Well, there are a lot of t um, tasks in food preparation that are highly repetitive and low productivity. So anything that's like doing the same thing over and over again or moving a box around um, or moving a cup around, a lot of those things can be automated. Even historically safe, stable, white collar jobs like doctors, lawyers, and bankers are at risk. There are a lot of people who think this is all about blue collar work, it is not. We already use services like TurboTax to replace tax advisors. At least your taxes are free. Amazon's Alexa and Apple's Siri have taken on secretarial tasks and much more. Hey Siri, read my schedule. You have 25 appointments at 715. Artificial intelligence is making inroads on the legal profession, financial sector, and the medical world. We need to start thinking about what's going to happen when uh, large numbers of highly skilled and narrow skilled human white collar workers are displaced. Hello there. My name is Movo. Welcome to Iros. You can get to know me and all I can do over the next minute and a half. The medical field is huge. In service robotics, if you want to identify a key area of growth, uh, it will be in the medical field. That is where everything is going. Movo is a research robot launching this year, and other robots have already made advances in medicine. Some surgeries have been transformed by robotics, and I tried out one of those machines. <laughs> All right. Okay, how's this work? Take one. All right, so um, go ahead and put your head in. So this system will detect your head presence. And so okay. I'll allow you. Jobs in fields like medicine and law will be just as affected by software we can't see than robots we can. Techies are in a race to replace jobs like radiologists, who spend much of their time looking at medical scans. Right now, we're able to read images about 10,000 times faster than human radiologists. Uh, so you can see that uh, we just processed 765 studies. That's about two days worth of work for a normal radiologist. And we were able to process it in about 46 seconds. Kevin Lyman is lead scientist at Enlytic, a startup working to redefine the role of a radiologist. Deep learning is essentially a series of algorithms for trying almost every possible combination. And what it ultimately arrives at is just an equation. I asked Kevin if his work could cause radiologists to lose their jobs. AI, for us, is creating a lot of jobs for radiologists and other doctors. Training AI to effectively do this is an enormously difficult task. So today I have to go to the doctor. Tomorrow there'll be artificial intelligence software that analyzes the information. That will keep track of my, my, you know, my heart rate, my, 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 my blood. AI software will know hundreds of millions of people. So it will have much, more better, much better knowledge than our doctors do. This, this is all happening faster than expected. And many of these techie dreams are already within sight. I've got a, I've got a four-year-old kid and a, a nine-month-old kid. And the things that I know about their future they're never going to learn how to drive a car. When people worry about cars being hacked or driving into people, they often forget the daily toll that could be avoided. The World Health Organization estimates that 1.25 million people die each year in traffic accidents. In the United States, that number is 34,000. I don't want a human driving my car or flying a plane because humans are infallible and don't learn as fast as, as technology. So 10, 15 years from now, rather than having servants and maids and chauffeurs, we'll have robots serving us. So you want to be a software engineer at Google? Go to algoexpert.io. Pick a question. Read the prompt. Before we arrive at the utopian world of the Jetsons, the shift is likely to be a bit more dystopian. So now what happens to the people? What happens to the, to, to the, to the Uber drivers? What happens to the truck drivers? What happens to the entire support system around these people? It begins to vanish. Over another five-year period, we're going to wipe out millions of jobs in the, in the United States and you know, tens of millions of jobs in the developing world. What happens to those people? 
Hey, I'm Joel. Thanks. Right. I hope it wasn't too long. Uh, but I thought it actually, you know, summarizes uh, kind of the issue that we have at hand right now, which is really, I mean, how is automation going to affect, you know, our jobs and our, you know, work. And also, you know, kind of uh, talks about one of the examples from one of the articles, which is the particularly self-driving uh, self driving trucks, right? So I prepared... Uh, small call right for you guys and i want you to participate i in. just wanted to, to, sure. to comment on one thing i was really glad that they they went and at the end and talked about the impact on the professional class because i had always thought about this as mm -hmm. you know you know uh the robots handling dangerous work where people can get crushed or maybe handling da dangerous chemicals or and and the self-driving cars was part of it but a couple of years ago i was in the uh we were visiting my family in the US and I wanted to do a get a little contract that just stated that if ever God forbid my wife and I died that mm -hmm. legally my sister would have custody of my kids mm -hmm. so that you know just went to the right person and and all that was clear yeah. and uh I called around and and lawyers said well I could do it for you but it would be dumb for you to have me do it and they said you could just go online and there's just so that whole segment of mm -hmm kind of entry level lawyer work or what you did was somebody said, I need a legally valid contract that I want you to set up. And then, you know, you, you wouldn't pay them a lot. You pay them $50 maybe. It's just a little bit of a thing, but that's just gone. And yeah. you and you don't do it for free on a phone. And, and in a way that's good, but also, I don't know, is it, is, is, is it, I, anyway, I was just very surprised by that. I was very surprised that the whole yeah. level of lawyering yeah. is gone. Yeah, that's that's something that we always kind of overlook as well, right? We think, you know, maybe we're highly educated, our jobs are gonna, you know, be in danger. I don't know, maybe, I mean, later on you'd have a robot that teaches much better than me and you, who knows, right? And uh, might be more fun for the students as well, make jokes and stuff. Yeah. So uh, I don't know, I think we're all at risk, but uh, come to think of it, right? I mean, there are also, you know, so many, things that happened in the past and we survived, like, you know, typewriting, right? So all of these people were, you know, typewriters. When the computer started, people thought, you know, they would, uh, they would not, you know, survive or would run out of work. And it actually, yeah, the whole job went away, right? So this typewriting went away, but, you know, other jobs opened up and I think it kind of compensates uh, for what happened. So the question is, right, that we want to ask you right now, is do you believe automation, AI and automation will lead to mass unemployment? Are you scared about your future or not your future, but maybe your kid's future or your you know, next generation? Do you think, right, that this technology or advances in AI are going to, you know, leave us unemployed? Okay. While, while people are filling out that poll, I just wanted to bring up another example from that, that case you talked about. Yeah. The, the term Luddite, when people say, oh, you're such a Luddite, you don't even want to learn how to use uh, Moodle or whatever. Yeah. Um, that actually comes from a historical movement in England. I didn't know, but the, the Luddites were a group of, they were weavers mm -hmm. who were angry about the, uh, the large mills that did industrial scale uh, milling of clothes. And they used to sneak in at night and and stick wrenches and, and things into the, the mill works to, to try to stop them because they thought there was going to be no work in making clothes ever for people again if, if the uh, autumn if the I guess more like mechanization okay if the mechanization yeah. of yeah. clothing happened yeah yeah that's interesting I didn't know that yeah could I add uh, something that I think uh, yeah. is interesting and not many of the articles <laughs> talked about uh, so basically. Uh, for the poll, I said, definitely, I think there's going to be some sort of uh, unemployment because of three main issues, I think. And uh, one of them I mentioned in my reflection, and I talked about ratios. So, so before, for example, you'd have one person doing one job. And now you'd have, if you, if you for example, the, the, um, you need operators, for example, for many machines. And so the new job opportunity, for example, would be operators. But, the, but for the ratios, you need one operator for multiple machines. So, so fewer jobs are going to open for 
far more automation happening. Uh, a second thing actually uh, Zhuzhi brought up in the reflections, and it was about qualifications, which I think is important because um, the articles talk about how it's throwing uh, lower skilled people out of the uh, out of the question. So it's only higher skilled people who are able to actually you get like benefit from these. Um, and the third main thing I think is that it's just happening so fast. So in the past, it was more like you had uh, innovations happening, for example, for a certain field and a new technology being used and everyone taking it up, for example, for the, for the typewriters, for example, it, I don't think it put anyone out of uh, work because you just moved on to that technology. In the case with automation, I think there is some sort of replacement happening. It's just that everyone has to move up the, um, the, like, uh, the working or social class, but some people that's impossible. So I think these three reasons are kind of linked. Uh, I'm gonna send them in the chat because they might have, uh, sure. I might have convoluted everything. Uh, but overall, it's basically the rate of new jobs versus the rate of automation. I think it's that's mainly the issue. Yeah. So this was mentioned in the video, right? It's spot on, but also I think was mentioned in the lecture, uh, the first lecture from the readings uh, you looked at, right? So they talked a little bit about, you know, that the rate is very fast. And also the issue with, you know, how do I overcome this? Well, one, one thing was, you know, better education and providing, you know, a higher level of education to more people because we will have to adapt. Yeah, people have to, like, they have to, everybody had to learn, you know, computer uh, literacy or, you know, have to overcome computer literacy. Uh, the same thing would happen, right? Would, there would be new jobs created. And so, you know, we need to learn new skills. Things will change. Yeah, And I think even the, the definition of jobs will change. A doctor might not be exactly, you know, the same, it's not the same skills needed and not the same, you know, duties. It's going to evolve and change. And the same thing, I think, for educators, for I, I could imagine every field that AI or automation will get into will change the dynamics of the whole field, in my opinion. Yeah, another, another really interesting example of that is you hear a lot in the US about the end of the manufacturing sector. Yeah. As a percentage of what is sold, what is made, and what is exported abroad, manufacturing is actually at like a 60-year high in the U.S., yeah. but it just doesn't employ as many people. You have to know a lot of math or maybe some engineering to get a, to get a lot of the manufacturing jobs that there are right now. You basically need to be one of the people who uh, tweaks and, main and maintains the... the and so even robots that, that, that do the, the um, high-tech manufacturing. So American companies are becoming a bit more like Germany. It's, it's very precise, high-tech manufacturing that's going on. And so the products are better, uh, but you don't need as many people to sort of pick up wheels and put them on cars. It's, it's, just, it's just a very different model. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I think what Khalil's pointing our attention to, attention to is, is, is quite important, yep. a quite yep. important factor in all this. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's it. Please go ahead. Um, yes, um, I just wanted to say, I think um, the rate at which our jobs, because you're saying the jobs would, would change, yeah. the rate at where they're going to um, change is, I think it's way slower than how AI is progressing. Mm -hmm. AI is like, the, at, in the near future, they're probably going to um, perfect maybe self-driving cars. So yeah. if, if, thing we know now about jobs about society works the same way it does you know it just makes sense like for an uber company right why would they if if a, a perfect you know error free self-driving car was made you know why would they need a, a driver and i think that's the the issue right like if if everything is just profit driven this yeah. will probably happen at least for a, for a period of time until you know governments yeah. you know get used to the thing so that i think there'll definitely be like a mass unemployment at some point yeah okay so i think so here try cynthia please go ahead yes yeah i said no okay. but i can't articulate exactly why i said no but i was just really uncomfortable with saying yes because <laughs> Yeah, I think there's something very technologically deterministic about saying yes. Mm -hmm. And that made me really uncomfortable. Like, 
um, this attributing such a huge social change to AI. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe if the question was phrased um, in a different way, maybe if the question was, is because of AI, um, not because of AI, like if the focus on, of the question was, is the government going to do anything or is there going to be, is anyone going to help these laborers, blah, blah, blah. I would have said, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Yeah. And there might be unemployment because of that, because of the lack of intervention and because of the lack of safety nets and um, the overt capitalist kind of ideology we exist in. Yeah. But when the question is about is AI gonna drive this huge social change then mm. I can't say yes mm. and that's why I put no. Okay. No, if that it, makes any sense. No, no, it, it does make sense and the fact you said you, you weren't able to articulate why it was is false. You articulated it very nicely. What you're saying is putting a question like this assumes that a lot of other things stay in place. That what we do is we think that uh, whether or not a person deserves to have a living wage is dependent on his or her capacity to provide some service that can help a company make a profit. And that's a choice. That, that's a choice that society makes in order to value people that way or not. And uh, I mean, this is, this is one of the things, one of the reasons why people have been talking, and it came up in the first lecture you guys watched, why some people have talked about a universal basic income as as part of this. This is what Andrew Yang ran on in the in the Democratic primaries in the U.S. That if all this technology is going to happen, productivity is going to go up. There's going to be more goods and services available. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I I don't know if it was you, Cynthia, or another person I was talking to in, in developing their uh, thesis for their final paper. Um, the Economist John Maynard Keynes, who developed a, a mon no, yeah, monetary policy, the idea that, that you government spend money to get out of recessions and re you bring the government below, uh, uh, you, you tax more in order to slow down inflation. And he was the most important economist for the rebuilding of Europe and after World War II. He made the, the uh, prediction that by like 1970, he thought, that we would have so much productivity that all of us would only have to have 15 hour work weeks. And he just said, he just saw, he saw that as inevitable. Like this productivity is growing and growing and growing. We're gonna have plenty of goods and services. Why don't we cut ourselves a break and just say we only have to work one and a half days a week. And, and that's not how it went because that's not how capital, the logic of capitalism works. We say, no, 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 we make everybody still work five days a week or five and a half, whatever, and we get even more goods and services. And it's all interconnected, right? This, that, that sort of is also part of what leads to consumerism, which is part of the, 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 the uh, climate crisis. So it, so many things are in there. Um, so anyway, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, for, for articulating that. Um, I think Mendes wanted to go next, and then we have Lina and Organa and Bashar, right? So maybe in that order is fine. Yeah, Mendes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I, this is a subject that I've been looking into, and I've been reading some papers uh, around it, and I, was, I stumbled across the um, uh, uh, papers that were produced by Aaron Bananav on uh, automation and the future of work. And he actually makes uh, some interesting conclusions that would support the no poll in, in this, and I would like to share them with you. So um, he looked at the, uh, at the study of economy and he linked economy and productivity growth to the loss of jobs that are happening. And he states the following, in contrast to the popular view that technology is destroying jobs, findings suggest that it is not the case. The period from 2010 to 2015, so that for every six technology related jobs uh, uh, created for every 10 lost, since, which is the lowest share of jobs lost to technology of any period since 1950 and the 1960s, which is also backed up by uh, a study by Atkinson and Wu, which is uh, on false alarmism. So there are tasks or jobs being replaced, but it also has been upgraded. So diversity of economy, fewer people doing each task, but there are much more tasks to be done. The economy is stagnating and can't keep up with slow rates of technological change. Not that tech is getting implemented at a fast speed, uh, at a fast pace. 
And here also Robert Gordon uh, speaks also about the uh, economic, uh, uh, economic uh, impacts of technology. And he said that um, comparing computers to airplanes and cars and combustion engines, the total, total economic effect was much smaller into, uh, into this. So there are, there are things that are happening and that are impacting us on this, on this line, which is the need for skill-based technical change and the skill upgrading. So as a, and this is where I'm, I'm interjecting my, my on, on, on this. Yes, there are jobs that are moving, but there are also jobs that are being created. So at which pace we as individuals are able to upgrade our skills and are able to upgrade our um, uh, know-how to perform those jobs that are actually uh, being created, this is where the challenge lies. So low impact, low skill jobs are being replaced with other types of jobs. So how fast are we going to head into that direction? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just uh, just one clarification, right? So we've, uh, we we came to the conclusion that it's not particularly just you know lower paid jobs or you know uh, like certain low low level skills, right? But we're all you know in danger to an extent, right? Or at least there is one view that sees this. Uh, so yes, and uh, I mean I, I feel like what you're saying is we you know we're fine throwing some people down the bus, right? So saying okay, you know there are certain people that will have to sacrifice, and, you know, but that's okay. You know the world will become stable eventually, and uh, yeah, that happened before I think. And at least that's what I understood from what you're saying. But uh, for the sake of time, we'll uh, you know we'll we'll take other opinions and then. Uh, you know, you can clarify to me if you want, or we can continue this discussion uh, after the class, if you, if you would like. Uh, so Bashar, I think it comes in order. So Bashar next, and then Ghana. Yeah, Bashar, you want to go next? Yeah, I mean, the point I want to make is that you should distinguish between two things. Yeah. One is the, uh, the, the change, what happens in the, in the interim period, mm -hmm. where uh, people are laid off because machines are replacing them. Mm -hmm. whether they are blue color jobs or white color jobs mm -hmm. uh, and that and the and the stage after that what would be the the the, the conditions of of work mm -hmm. once uh, uh, people adjust yeah. to this you know so so there is there is a period where where there will be suffering unless the governments mm -hmm. uh, intervene to reduce it and i think this time the fact that it's this uh, a machine uh, technology uh, does not affect only the uh, upper middle class. Yeah. It, its impact on politics will be different. So, so, so the way the way the government will respond to this mm -hmm. might be different than the way it responded in the past. Although in some cases, also the response, some governments provide, provided social welfare to 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 ease the unemployment burden but in this case it will be a different kind of uh, uh, situation especially specifically because this will hit even those who are supposedly elite yeah, yeah. so the elite are hit and this means a different a huge a hugely different uh, uh, impact then the question becomes what would happen in the more distant future if ai be, can do most of the jobs what can we do ourselves now one one vision would be the Marxist vision, you know, and this is what Marx thought that when productivity is so abundant, yeah. we can just simply fish in the you know uh, uh, in the morning, uh, go to friends, go for a walk, read literature. Uh, in, in that sense, of course, that's that would be the utopian uh, image. When 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 this, less than that, as Hans said, maybe the idea of a basic universal basic income becomes. Uh, more popular and the amount available for that income, the purchasing power of that income will be much higher than what's affordable now. Now universal uh, 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 income, a basic income doesn't amount to much, but then maybe later it will amount. And what would make it probably, what one wants to be optimistic likely is the fact that the wide sector of society, including the elite are, would, would demand that. So, so, so in that sense, you, one might look not that there's no, there won't be unemployment. There will be unemployment, maybe in the in the short term, because the adjustment will will not happen immediately. But the political change and 
social change might create a better world. So, so, but, but that depends on many things. But I think there is a, there is a difference between the, the old change in, 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 uh, in technology, which made people unemployed and the new one yeah. in yeah. terms of what kind of sectors it hits. Absolutely, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I, I think this is, you know, two great points that you've made for sure. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure the, the rest of the class agrees. So Ghana, you wanna uh, go next? Um, so I believe that uh, AI has an incredible capacity to just blindside us. And because it has the capacity to blindside us, it can put us out of jobs. We all can agree that low income workers and even professional workers, um, you know, their jobs may be targeted. And when you think about it, I thought about it in 200 years, what would be the only jobs that exist? The AI developers. But when you think about it, they're not even safe because eventually we'll create robots that are so good, they'll just create more robots. So, and I don't think that um, this matter is being discussed. We, we, like, we just discussed it in the course and it's blind signing to me. So imagine um, in 20 years when these robots are actually going to market, people will be blindsided, not just by the availability of information and the fact that it's not, but also by the fact that I feel like um, there is so much push against AI and because of the fact that they think it's taking their job or also due to issues of bias and how mismanaged the current systems are that we might be too focused on halting the development of something that's going to be developed anyways too much to actually like accommodate and acclimate to living with it so our policies are just futile yeah yeah so i think yeah uh, this is also a very good point i think you know um, Bashar's view was maybe more optimistic and uh, maybe I would like to take his you know his view I mean as, as moving forward it's comforting and it uh, makes you think you know maybe th maybe this was all all for for you know uh, having our lives getting much better yeah so maybe we'll end up you know having our lives much better rather than we okay, yeah. okay, yes yeah, I, I wonder if, if you might it sounded to me like you had a more optimistic proposal in there the, the, Oh no. Is that, yeah. Damn it. Okay, thanks. Thanks. That, 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 that's an interesting tweak. Um, can I ask Bashar, or should we, Bashar? My, uh, I'm curious what um, evidence you have for your optimism that the are going to uh, help us. Yeah. Um, I don't. And I don't mean just you know. Uh, the middle class, but you know, uh, my worry in the big structural thing is this: this de developing in technology is just increasing the, the power of the billionaire class, and they don't care about what doctors say or what professors say or what uh, lawyers have to say. They kind of are kings. So, I mean, isn't the real worry those guys, and, and not whether or not you know the professoriate and the in the what do you what's the other one professional oriate? Um, or feel threatened? Yeah, I, I think I think if we assume that democracy will continue to operate, so people vote, now the, 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 the middle class uh, uh, and the elite are big enough in developed countries to actually make uh, uh, the, the main decision in, in politics. Uh, and they can vote, but sometimes working class come with vengeance, like in the case of US and the election of Trump, that is a franchised working class uh, hit back. But middle class is big enough to uh, impact the result of voting in a crucial way. So if you assume that democracy will continue, 
then I disagree with you because the billionaires are very few in number. So, uh, and, and they cannot, you know, and, and those who are educated can respond. It's not they can be deceived by, by uh, 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 populism and, uh, and all kinds of rhetoric. So I think if we assume democracy continues, then I, I think this would not happen. The, okay. the, the, the one percent uh, controlling uh, 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 the U.S. is not is not consistent with the persistence of, of democracy, unless okay. we assume that yeah. democracy cannot. Can, the second the second point, I just use my optimism. I think the optimism is on the long term. In the short term, it might be quite painful. Until yeah, the society you, you adjusts, made, you made so, that clear yeah, before. Yeah, 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 before, yeah. and that 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 does uh, that, that is that is scary. I the, the, we we shouldn't continue this now. We, you and I should continue this conversation. But I think you're underestimating the way that the billionaires can manipulate a democracy like the U.S. And I also don't think you're worried enough about the power of China that's on the horizon. But that's a conversation for another day, Bashar. Thanks, thanks for your uh, provocative comments. Okay, so I think. Uh, uh, should we move on to one last thing? We have yes. like 10 minutes left, right? So I think right, what we wanted to show you next is you know, kind of bring uh, these two issues that we've discussed together. So I have a small video for you. I'm not gonna you know, play the whole video, just a minute of it. And then we'll do another poll and open discussion again, right? So has anyone ever driven in Cairo here? Starting out with any project management screen, software, usually. I was looking out of my window in a Cairo hotel <laughs> and um, this driver saw that the that there was a traffic jam up ahead. Yeah. And we, had, we were in a very high room. It was quite a nice hotel room. And um, we could see that this big panorama. He backed up over a kilometer with oncoming traffic. Yeah. In, in eight lanes, I think it was six six lanes, and he was driving so fast backwards, and people were just diving out of his way. Yeah, yeah. I was very impressed. Yeah, so <laughs> that's really what this video about. That's really a flavor like of, you know, you... driving in Cairo. There are no lanes per se. Cars just seem to flow. But more often than not. It's stop and go. Even ambulances don't get a break. The few traffic cops quickly get lost in the shuffle and eventually give up. Though the rules are, in fact, pretty straightforward. If you can get halfway through an intersection, then you have the right of way. You can also just convince everyone that you're not about to stop. if you can get enough cars to follow you. On the upside, if you miss your exit, it's okay to drive the wrong way down a major highway. Though you're not supposed to tell anyone. In fact, you can drive the wrong way down almost any street as long as your car is facing in the right direction. Okay, so I'll stop here, try to get a sense of what, where we're heading. And I'm going to, you know, create another poll quickly. Hello. There is some issues with the internet connection today. Sorry for that. Did you see any of the video or not? Some people are 
So we got, I think we've got a sense of what they were trying to say. Okay, yeah, okay, great. So I just wanna, you know, create a, like, just another problem, right? That I'm going to launch. And we're asking really, I mean, do you believe, you know, this whole thing, right? This, this whole module about, you know, automation and labor and self-driving cars and all of this, is this even relevant to us in this region? Do we need to worry about it? What do you think? I mean, something like that, if you imagine at all in a million years, right, the self-driving car would be able to navigate the streets of Cairo or by route, maybe, you know, by route better, you know. Can you explain, can you just uh, clarify, like a little bit of explanation of what- Where, where are you from? Uh, where are you from, Daniel? You're from Nigeria, right? I'm from Nigeria. Yeah. Nigeria. I don't know how the traffic is there. Do you imagine if you, you know, in your hometown that you will be have self-driving cars in say 10 years or five years? Is it something that- East can... Lagos is very similar to, I don't know if you're from a smaller city than that, Daniel, but I know that Lagos has is at least as much, many traffic problems as Cairo. Yeah, I'm currently in Lagos, so yes, <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, so, so the question yeah. is, do you, do you think this is uh, something that is not applicable to our region or do you think, right, this is- So, uh, Shadia, do you want, are you trying to get people to consider whether or not self-driving cars could function in a place like Lagos or Cairo or New Delhi? Yeah, in, in a way, right? I mean, what, whether this whole debate, right, about self-driving cars and, you know, who's uh, going to be in charge of somebody, I mean, is it even possibility, right, that we'll see self-driving cars and, and you know, I one of our cities, right? Uh, What's that? I don't think it's that far-fetched. Okay, can you tell us uh, how, right? I mean, how, like in, in Beirut, for instance, how is it going yeah, to- I feel like maybe ride? they would start yeah. in the more developed countries, mm -hmm. but I feel like eventually they would reach the Arab world, maybe not directly, but like maybe mm -hmm. in the form of taxis or, you know, they'd slowly implement them here just to see if, Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't think it's that impossible. Yeah. But definitely, we won't we won't perfect it. That's for sure. Yeah. The problem with the, with these cars is that they you know they have to follow the rules first of all, right? So you cannot try to say create a self driving yeah, car. There needs to be order. Until so you know, you break the rules yeah. when, it, when you have. Yeah, it, right? exactly. That, that example from the first yeah. video you showed that, 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 that he remarked very clearly when the bale of hay was there, it made a legal and safe lane change. Legal and safe lane change. What the heck is that in Beirut? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Can I, can I, yeah, sure. can I say something about? Yeah. Can I say yeah, something about? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I think you know, definitely in this case, it's not the technology that's a problem; it's the infrastructure. Now, it it might work in the Gulf because they have a better infrastructure, but not in in yeah. Beirut. Yeah. But but that is not unique because we haven't still yet implemented trains here. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Uh, which is old technology. Because yeah. of infrastructure, so yeah. it's not a, it's not an anomaly that we will not be able to yeah. adopt uh, self-driving cars uh, 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 since we haven't even yet do it with, with trains. We have done it and we failed at some point and we stopped. So so that's a that's not a technological problem. It's a, it's a it's a development problem. Exactly right. That's true. Right. So speaking of trains, maybe just uh, want to tell you a little story about the trains as well and, you know, self-driving cars. So in Egypt recently, right, and a couple of weeks ago, there was huge delays in the trains between Cairo and Alexandria. It usually takes, the strip takes around two hours. They're very efficient, right? We've had trains since forever. And suddenly these trips were taking around six hours on a daily basis. And, you know, this happened for a whole week or something like this. So uh, they tried to understand what's happening and it turns out that uh, the train drivers were refusing to stop the automated system. So they installed a new automated system called uh, AWS or something like this, or ATS maybe. And this automated system would stop, you know, every time there is, you know, a, a certain traffic light uh, that was supposed to be there, but they're doing some construction on it or something like this. They're doing some maintenance of the road. And so the automated system would stop with every one of these, you know, uh, construction sites. And it ended up, you know, stopping 10 or 15 minutes, maybe 10 or 15 times throughout the trip from Cairo to Alexandria. And people would, the drivers would not, uh, they used to before stop the system or override the system. But then an accident happened and the guy, you know, was, uh, was 
held responsible and he went, he was jailed for nine years. And so after that, right, all of the drivers decided, you know, we're not going to intervene. We're not going to be human in the loop. We're just going to let the system work automatically. And, you know, th this is another example of how, you know, we need clear regulations and we need to be able to understand that this is actually very contextual as well. And it could differ from one place to the other. Yeah. Just, yeah. I have a link to this article. Um, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say, like, there needs to be order. So in a country with no order, I don't think we can have proper, like, technology, you know, to, to properly move in, like, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, I keep thinking about Lebanon and how it could have the potential to have this kind of, you know, technological advances. But thinking back to order, it's like this country has no order. So, this, so I, I get a sense of hopelessness. <laughs> The driving's gotten better during the 10 plus years I've been here. There used to be almost no functioning stoplights and people are a little bit more careful about staying in the lane and some people even actually signal to change lanes. It's a, it's, when I first got here, I, 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 I couldn't handle driving. Now I do it pretty often. Um, so I think, I think it's not a completely lost cause or completely a cause without hope. It's not, it's not one yet, but I think, I think it can get better. I we can only hope so, sir. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, if I can say something about this, it's uh, uh, the this applies to driving car, self-driving cars because they need a really major infrastructure. But uh, it doesn't apply to the other many of other technologies such as you know reading uh, 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 you know X-rays that doesn't need uh, infrastructure. So so these doctors, radiologists. Uh, uh, will be affected by this technology. Uh, so, so, but, but, so, so we have to, self-driving cars is a special case because it needs infrastructure, but most of the other technologies don't need them. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yes, somebody else wanna add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add something. Sure. I said, I said no, because I think in the like neo imperial kind of world we live in, we cannot disconnect our problems from the problems of the West and what they can possibly impose. Not that we don't have agency and we can't revolt against it or that it won't work here, but I think it is definitely still a concern for us. Mm -hmm. And I also really, really, really hate the word first world. <laughs> and um, yeah. Okay, yeah. not that since, yeah. Just, <laughs> you, have, you have a lot of issues today with my polls. So I'll have to <laughs> work on them to improve them. <laughs> it's completely all right. But you know, even that phrase, like, yeah. it implies that where, like, there isn't a relationship between mm -hmm. um, the global south and, like, the west, but mm -hmm. there is one, right? That's there always is one. Point. That's actually a good point. So, Thank you for yeah. mentioning this. Uh, yeah, so... I just want to add something. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Kind of off top. Imagine like in a, in a decade or a few hundred years, let's say everyone has self-driving cars, but what's the point if we can have really good and well-built public transport? Yay. Uh, right? If everyone oh just God. has a self-driving car, you can just have like many trains. So that, that cuts down on distances. So, yeah. at least in cities. So, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I recently, not recently, it's quite a few years ago now, but uh, my wife and I went to Italy. I went to a conference up in uh, uh, Assisi. And we got from Rome and did tour stuff in Rome, including museum and, you know, all the stuff you do at the Colosseum and all that. And then up to Assisi and back without, without we never even got into a taxi. We, we took trains and streetcar and, and everywhere. It was, the, the, the train system there was so impressive. And I learned that they, they run at a loss. It's just considered a public good that you need to have public transit that people can use. And so you can function in the society without being able to afford a car, which is just awesome. That is uh, definitely a good model. A lot of, you know, anyway. Uh, yeah, it's actually the same thing in Budapest. I went uh, last year and it was incredible. There were, I didn't enter a single taxi. There were barely any cars anywhere, like not on the road, not parked. 
it was just all taking trains, trams, and uh, buses. And it was all perfectly integrated with Google Maps as well. So the maps would tell you walk to this station, take it three stops, then take this tram. It was perfect. It was honestly incredible. Uh, yeah. And I came back to Lebanon and had to take a service. And that was disappointing. <laughs> Yeah, makes sense. Yet again, guys, that was a very good discussion. Thank you. Yeah. I think we are now after 3.15. Yes, so we you know, we took more time than we usually do. We have one last session on Wednesday, so hope you're uh, looking forward to it. Uh, not because the class will end, but because it's uh, you know a wrap up of the whole course. So I think we have a few articles that are really good uh, for you to read. And uh, we are going to send a uh, doodle we'll do. poll soon yeah. about uh, the, the session for our final, when you guys will sort of present or talk a little bit about your projects. Yeah. And we, the Dean of F FAS and the Dean of MSF FEA are said they're going to come. So we have some famous guests. Yeah. So look for that doodle poll in the email uh, or maybe on the, the web page. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone. The project's due the 14th of December. Thank you, professors. You're welcome. And I apologize for being, for being disconnected a couple of times today. So I had some issues, internet connection issues. I hope that wasn't a, a big problem for the class. See you next week.